At this time, I would like for us to uh, pause and um, uh, quiet our minds as we prepare for worship now. Let's uh, begin our service by singing, O come all ye faithful, may we stand. given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Today we continue in the line of the church, carrying out the call that Jesus has placed on us, and we celebrate together the baptism of Caleb Hall. Caleb came forward uh, a couple of weeks ago professing his faith in Jesus Christ. And Caleb, I ask you this question. What is your profession of faith? Jesus is Lord. Repeat after me. I believe. I believe. Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He lived a sinless life. Suffered under Pilate. Suffered under Pilate. Was crucified for my sins. Was crucified for my sins. Was buried. Was buried. And rose again on the third day. And rose again on the third day. Amen. Caleb, on hearing this profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in death. And raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen? Amen. We rejoice in this as we rejoice in every miracle that happens when someone puts their faith and hope in Jesus Christ. If you'll take your bulletins and, uh, and open the third page. Catechism question number 60. I'll read the question if you'll read along with me for the answer. What does Christ's resurrection mean for us? Christ's triumph over sin and death by being physically resurrected so that all who trust in him are raised to new life in this world and to everlasting life in the world to come, just as one day will be there, so this world will one day be restored. But those who do not trust in Christ will be raised to everlasting death. Scripture reading this morning is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, having to do with the coming of the Lord. 
But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Please join me as we uh, hear the words of the psalmist on uh, Psalm 36, a prayer of praise. Your steadfast love, O God, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. There evildoers lie fallen, they are thrust down, unable to rise. Amen. Good Christian men rejoice. May we all stand and sing. morning I will be reading Matthew chapter 9 verses 35 through 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds he had compassion for them because they were, were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I mentioned earlier this morning about the, uh, uh, the week of prayer for international missions today. Today is actually day eight since we started uh, last week with uh, day one. Um, our topic today, our, our series has been different methods of how we will reach the lost or different ways that we will reach the lost. Today's uh, focus is that we will reach the lost through commitment. And I'm going to read just a, a few portions of the um, um, the segment that's from the online uh, version of the, the week of prayer for today. Um, Central Asia is a region where natural disasters are common. Large earthquakes like February's uh, earthquakes in Turkey and Syria make the national news, 
But earthquakes of all sizes are also common there. Even small earthquakes can block roads, cutting off entire areas from aid. Central Asia also faces other catastrophic events like extreme temperatures, mudslides, floods, and avalanches. Disaster Relief Ministry is vital in Central Asia, and IMB workers are uniquely positioned to respond. In the first six months of this year, they have been involved in more than 80 different projects that have included things like clean water systems, flood and earthquake relief, trauma care, food distribution, women's health initiatives, and job skills for refugees. IMB workers have been faithful to plan these projects and undergird national believers to help their villages, towns, and people. For missionaries, their love and compassion for people groups doesn't form when disaster hits. They've loved the people that they serve for many years, some decades. They've learned the languages and the customs and, and many face the realities of natural disasters along with their national friends. Quote, for us, it's about relationships. Robert Botta said, Botta has served among Central Asian peoples for over two decades. He is one of many workers who focus on relief work. Missionaries report that national churches find ways to be the hands and feet of Jesus while sharing a message of eternal hope. By strengthening local churches and believers, compassion and aid isn't a one-time occurrence or only a response to immediate need. The benefit of working through partners on the field who have relationship with nationals is that aid is closely linked to long-term gospel access. For example, a family who receive fresh water, blankets, food, and shelter for the short term, but they will also meet believers who will share the hope of Christ and connect them to local Christians. This is our commitment to fulfill the Great Commission no matter the cost. Through our missionaries, we learn best how to serve and how to love. We support them because they are the hands and feet of Jesus in places many of us will never go. Let us pray now. God, we do ask you to bless the long-term commitment of the International Mission Board and national Christians who faithfully serve. We pray for Robert Botta and others serving in disaster relief work that they would have strength and wisdom during difficult days. We ask you to lead Southern Baptists to stay focused on reaching the nations and to generously support those who are working among the world's lost. Amen. I'll stand and sing.
crossed over and cast aside both crown and throne to live beside the common man as was foretold the promised one Silent night, holy night. Let's all stand together.
We bow with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we come today and worship you, and we read scriptures about the harvest, and we've seen evidence that today through the ordinance of baptism, another soul accepting you. And we thank you that we have workers here, even though we're far removed from the harvest of the land in most of our jobs, we realize the harvest and the work still continues in your world. We thank you that we have people that are willing to give to carry out that harvest work in mission fields. We thank you that we have people that are willing to give of their time and their talents to harvest here in our own congregation as we've seen witness today with acceptance of Christ by Caleb. We thank you so much for that. We thank you as we return the harvest to you through our donations, through our sacrifices, and through our monies that we can continue that work. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This time of year is a time of rejoicing. It's a time of year that you probably have parties to attend and travel arrangements to make to get together with family and friends. You're looking forward to opening presents and seeing what kind of haul you made this year at Christmas time. And we are rejoicing today at the celebration of baptism and new life, and there is much to rejoice in. And the scripture says that we should rejoice with those who are rejoicing, and that we should weep with those who mourn. And it's appropriate for us as a congregation to take time during this wonderful time of year, to remember that here with us today, joining us in our celebration, are those who are mourning. We have numerous, I believe I counted, 15 different widows or widowers in our congregation. That the holidays, while everyone else is rejoicing, always ends up being a painful reminder, not just of what was given, though they celebrate that and honestly celebrate that, but they are also mourning that which has been taken away, either by death or by sickness that no longer allows their loved ones to travel and be with you. Or from broken families that were together this time last year, but this is the first year that the family just won't be together either because of distance or because of divorce. There are people who will be mourning in the midst of celebration. And so today as we take the time to approach the scriptures, let us pause and mourn with those who are mourning and pray that God would strengthen them during these special holy days. Let's pray together as a family. Father God, you are so good to us. You have gifted us with great things. The highest of all being our Savior Jesus Christ who put on flesh and dwelt among men and yet went to a cross to die for our sins. And we are right in rejoicing at what the angels proclaimed. Peace on earth and goodwill 
towards men upon whom your favor falls. And we can be like the shepherds who go away from hearing this truth, celebrating and rejoicing. And yet, Father, we recognize that there is a time to rejoice and a time to mourn. And we pray that you would help us to be mindful of those who are grieving during this season. And as we see someone, even at one of our family gatherings, a little withdrawn, a little quieter than usual. That we would not just try to tell them to put on a smile and a happy face, but Father, that we would be with them, that you would use us as agents of comfort. That one of the fastest gifts we would be willing to give would be a shoulder to cry on or arms that would hug in an embrace when needed. That our ears would be quick to listen. And our mouths would often be quick to be silent. As sometimes there's not right words. But just being there's enough. So I pray, Father, you help us to be there. That we would not just send a text and feel like we've done enough. That we would not simply give a thumbs up or a care figure on Facebook. But that if we were able to go, Father, that we would go and be there. And if we're not able to go, that we would use our phones to call and allow our voices to be heard. But Father, however you can use us, please use us for your glory. And help us not to take the credit for any of this but to point towards you and, and just to share that we are only passing on the comfort that we have received from other people, all in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So be with those who are grieving and move us to be with those who are grieving. For we pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so... Um, we're, we're going to be doing a lot of hop skipping and jumping again this week. Uh, you know, last week a, a few of you came up and said, you know, you're not used to me skipping verses and everything, but when you see that, and I know what, what chapters I put on there, yeah, 15's still good, 17's still good, 18's still good, 21 good, but I'm also going to throw in 25 and 29 for good measure, all right? So you might think that, okay, that's six different chapters. Fear not, for I have heard you. Um, and I'm only going to be doing, on average, six verses from all of those chapters. A couple of those chapters, only one or two verses. All right, so take a breath. We can do this together. Um, but if you do have a Bible and, and, and can find Genesis, let me invite you to open that Bible and start in Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, we find these words. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now, if you go over to chapter 17, which means you have to skip 16. It is important. Genesis 17, beginning in verse 15, we see these words. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, 
I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? All right, now go to chapter 18. Then look at verse 9. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it saying, I did not laugh for she was afraid. He said, no, no. But you did laugh. And then go to Genesis 21. Beginning in verse 1. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, who Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Now, for extra credit, go to Genesis 25. And I'm going to jump in at verse 20. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And then, last but not least, well, I say last, but it's the last of Genesis. There'll be more. Genesis chapter 29 Verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. This time of year is a time where we talk about believing things. Believing things that seem too good to be true. We can't turn on the television without seeing some kind of cartoon or show or movie that we've watched, oh, a hundred times before. That the only way to enjoy and appreciate the movie is if you suspend your disbelief. Because as we know, magic hats really can make snowmen dance around. And as we know... That at this time of year, reindeer really can fly. A man can visit every single household all around the world, all in just one night. And trains do go down the middle of the street. And regardless of how long the journey is, will always arrive just in time for Christmas. If you just believe. 
Stop your disbelief. And if someone dare question one of the things of which I just said, we call them names. You old Grinch. Look, Scrooge is returned, right? We want to enjoy belief. And as we go through these passages that we find here in Genesis, we find things that are a little hard to believe, and not just for us, but for the actual people that are involved in these accounts. Now, I want to make sure that one thing is very clear. When I call for you to believe these things, it's on a much higher magnitude than I would ever call you to believe in Frosty or Rudolph. These are literal, historical accounts of events that actually took place. And so there was an actual Abraham who was old. And his wife was old. Not, not as old. But she was 90 years old. Now if I came to you and said, when you are 91 years old, you're going to have a son, ladies. Some of you can't even help but laugh. You're like, <laughs> nope. Some of you went, I took care of that years ago. You know what? I don't care what surgeries you've had. I don't care what's happened in your life. I'm telling you, at 91 years old, you're going to give birth. Not one of you believe me. Because that would be pretty hard to see. You would make all kinds of medical journals. And people would say that it was a lie, a trick, nothing you could ever do would force them to believe this because we know this. 90-year-old women don't give birth. It just doesn't happen. And so Abraham is right to question when God tells him, look, I'm going to give you many things. And Abram starts out by saying, well, what good is it going to do me? I have no one to pass these things on to. And when God says, I will give you a son, he goes, okay. Because you say it, Lord, I'll believe it. But then Sarah eavesdropping, hearing someone tell Abram, your wife is going to have a child next year. I'm going to come back and she's going to have a child for her just to go, <laughs> now that I'm worn out, you think that's going to happen? Are you kidding me? In fact, the laughter was so real, even though she denied it, you know, she said, I didn't laugh. The Lord had to call her. Yes, you did. Laughter became so real that that's what she names her child and says, from this day forward, everyone will laugh over me. I've never once told this story and not seen women laugh when I, when I told it. I've never once been able to pull it off because every time I bring up the point, you could have a child at 90, it's almost universal. <laughs> that's crazy. It's ridiculous and we laugh at this. And yet when she says, I'm looking now at chapter 18, when God's speaking and says, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? And this is his question that he poses. Is anything too hard for the Lord? It is a ridiculous notion if I was to simply say a 90-year-old woman is going to have a child. Yet, let's put this in the proper context of what's happened in Genesis so far. All right, so I'm not, I'm not going to go past Genesis. Just up to Sarah's time, what has taken place? Well, God has created everything that exists, and he did so in six days. 
He didn't use other building blocks. He simply spoke and everything came into existence. He said, let there be light. And there was no light switch for him to play a joke on, to flip up and say, ah, see, look, the lights are on in the room. He literally created light in that moment and said, let it exist. And it existed. He literally made living creatures by speaking them into existence. And trees with all kinds of fruit that contained seeds to produce other trees that would make fruit. And he spoke and they existed. So that's happened. Also in Genesis at this point, there's been a worldwide flood that's destroyed everything at God's exact timing. And he protected Noah and his family and the animals of this world. So that's happened. When we look at this question, why did Sarah laugh? If we stand looking only at humanity, we all laugh too. That's ridiculous. But... If instead of looking at the world through the lens of what's normal, if we look at the world through the lens of what can God do, and I was to say to you, God will make this happen, it's not ridiculous anymore. When we view things in this world through the lens of who is God who has said it will be, it's easy to believe. For if God can create the world in six days, he can surely cause one person in that world to have a child. And yet we have this unusual barrenness motif that runs throughout Genesis and into other Old Testament books as well. I just decided to stop at Genesis because it kind of gets the point across. But there's something amazing that happens as we look at the other people in Genesis that are barren. Sarah gets chapters where it's the issue. Over and over, and, and it goes into the language. She was old. The way of women had stopped, and all of these things of going, look, it's a huge problem, it's a huge problem, but then Sarah gives birth to Isaac. And then Isaac's wife, she's barren, and she gets a verse, half a verse where it's a problem. He prayed for her, she was barren, then she had a child. And then you move forward in the next generation. She's barren. And then she's going to have a child because she's going to be prayed for and she's going to have a child. You don't get all of this long, drawn-out narrative of how much of a problem it is because the drama's gone. The first time it seems like a huge issue, major drama Sarah doesn't have a child and she's old and this just can't happen, but then she has a child. So when we move to the ne next generation and she's barren, we just sit and go back, yeah, God can take care of that. I know because he's already done that. And then the next story, she's barren and they, they try to add a little tension in. I didn't go and read all of, of chapter 25 or 29. I didn't read all of that, but all of the drama feels really empty. Because you're just sitting there waiting going, I know it's going to work. I know what God can do. Now fast forward hundreds of years to Luke chapter 1. And in Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 30, we find these words. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, 
your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This motif that plays out all throughout the book of Genesis of women who should not be able to have children having children is repeated again at Christmas time. But in a larger scale, because in the case of all of the women that we see in Genesis, they all had husbands and had known them in a way that brings forth children. Mary is not fully married yet. She's betrothed has never been with the man, and the angel says, you're going to have a child, and she goes, how is that going to be? That's not physically possible. And the angel says, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. Nothing is impossible with God. The same thing the Lord had said back in Genesis 18. What's impossible with me? With the Lord, what's impossible? So when the angel says it to Mary, she's heard these exact words in the same exact context. Someone who can't have children can have children if the Lord says so. And Mary hears that and goes, let it be however you've said. She believed because she knows God can do it. He's already done it before. And so when I call us to believe this story today, when I call us to to hear what's happened, and when I call you to believe all that Jesus ends up being, just as the angel says, the king of kings who will sit on the throne of the house of Jacob forever, the one that cannot be dethroned, the one that came and dwelt among us, born of a virgin, that he would be holy, that his life was sinless, And that ultimately he gave his life to die on a cross, not for his sins, but for your sins and my sins. And that while he was put into a tomb, three days later he physically walked out of that tomb. The world will say, how can that be? And our answer is this, with God nothing is impossible. So it doesn't matter what sins you've done in your life, God is able to forgive you because the work's already been done. Jesus Christ has already been crucified for your sins. It's accomplished, finished. It's not about you trying to live up to everything. It's the fact that Jesus was willing to die for everything. But pastor, you don't know what I've done. I don't care doesn't matter because the scripture tells us today if you hear his voice today if you call upon the name of the Lord you will be saved and not just that starting salvation saved day by day by day because there's many people in here that have put your faith and hope in Jesus Christ And yet there's a sin that keeps nagging at you and you just keep falling into and you're struggling against and you're fighting against and you're ready to give up hope and you're ready to just give in and say, you know what, God's just going to overlook this one. I can't beat this one. Hear me when I say this. Jesus Christ bled and died for that sin. He can deliver you from it. But the problem is oftentimes we try to beat the sin instead of saying, I can't beat it. I need Jesus to work in and through me. You can't beat that sin. Jesus already has. Nothing is impossible with God. Now that first passage that I read from Genesis 15, it's so important that we all understand the truth of what that last verse said. After God took Abram out of the tent and had him look at all of the stars and said, that's what your offspring is going to be like. If you, can count, if you can count all of those, imagine that's what your offspring is going to be like. And Abram believed and it was 
counted to him as righteousness. Not Abram started going to church. Not Abram strived to do better. Not Abram then began a Bible study. Abram believed. So brothers and sisters, friends, do you believe that God can save you? If so, he does. Trust him today. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much that with you, nothing is impossible. Thank you that us being too old is not a hindrance to you working in us and through us. Thank you that us being too young or not having the right experiences or doing the right thing does not hinder you from working in and through us. And above all, thank you that our sin does not hinder you from saving us because your son, Jesus Christ, already bled and died on the cross for our sins. And while he was buried, on the third day he rose again. Truly, nothing is impossible with you. Grant that we might believe and that by believing we might be saved. For I pray this in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ who was born of a virgin. Amen. Today, if you need to pronounce that you believe these things, while we sing this song, I want to invite you, come and share that with me. I, I know there's a group here that would love to rejoice with you in that decision. And I want to walk with you through the scriptures that you might know that you are forgiven through Jesus Christ. If you need to respond, now's the time. Let's stand as we sing. Nothing is impossible with God. Trust Him. 
Let's receive the benediction together as one family. Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, thank you that in you all things are possible. Help us to trust. For in our belief, Father, we are counted righteous. And so, Father, grant us belief. And now as we leave this place today, guard our hearts and our minds by granting us your peace. Amen.